Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Wisconsin Institute for the Public Policy and Service, or WIPS, I welcome you to the fourth annual James F. Feninga Lecture on Religion and Politics series featuring Bishop Richard Pates. My name is Gail Kell, and I am the program manager here at WIPS. Tonight's forum is entitled The Pope's Encyclical, Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship. The Most Reverend Bishop Richard E. Pates of the Des Moines Diocese will be presenting. This is part two of a two-part series. On April 15th and 16th, we welcomed Sister Simone Campbell and Jean Faraka to start the conversation on the theme of the Pope's encyclical and its engaging message about climate change and shared responsibility. Founded in 2007, the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service is a unit of the UW Colleges and UW Extension. Our mission is to address local, state, and national issues by linking public scholarship, civic outreach, and student service to enhance community life throughout Wisconsin. This lecture series was established in 2012 in honor of Jim Veninga, founder of WIPS. Jim served as the executive director of the Texas State Humanities Council for 22 years, from 1975 to 1997. He served as dean of UW Marathon County from 2000 to 2007. During his career, Jim was a recognized national leader for the public humanities. His brilliant essays and intellectual energy inspired his colleagues from humanities councils around the country. Jim passed away peacefully in early 2014. Tonight's forum would not be possible without the hard work of our planning team, including Drs. Corey Norbaum and Eric Giordano, Deb Dorhorst, Connie Nikolai, Alex Sawaya, Jacob Simon, and WIPS interns Sam, Connor, Chang, Jonathan, and Lauren. We are thankful for technical support from theater manager Chris Berg. We would also like to thank those donors who have made this event possible. We are grateful to the Wisconsin Humanities Council for their grant support, as well as the B.A. and Esther Greenheck Foundation for their contribution towards this series. We also rely on generous contribution from fine folks like you. If you're interested, please uh, make a donation uh, and see one of our staff members for an envelope. At a certain point in the discussion this evening, you, the audience, will have an opportunity to join the conversation. Microphone runners will circulate around to those wishing to ask a question. We ask that you each accord our guests and each other the courtesy and respect that we all expect from a public forum dedicated to civil dialogue. At this time, please check cell phones and electronic devices to see that they're silenced. We will conclude tonight's forum by 8.30 p.m. So we are extremely pleased to welcome this year's Veninga Series special guest, the Most Reverend Bishop Richard E. Pates of the Des Moines Diocese. On December 20th, 1968, Bishop Pates was ordained to the priesthood at St. Peter's Basilica, Vatican City, Rome. He was named the ninth bishop of the Des Moines Diocese in Iowa by Pope Benedict XVI on April 10th, 2008. Installed on the following May 29th, he is the third consecutive Twin Cities Auxiliary Bishop to be named ordinary of that diocese. On November 14, 2011, Bishop Pates was elected chairman of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on International Justice and Peace at the 2011 Bishops' Meeting. As chair, Bishop Pates saw firsthand the global suffering of people forced to leave their homes due to severe weather and food and water shortages. In an op-ed piece in the National Catholic Reporter, Bishop Pates said, the dialogue we need is not about whether to act on climate change, but how to act. His talk here tonight will focus on the causes of climate change, chiefly accountable to our human behavior, and what it will take for people to become involved citizens in helping the earth. So please help me in welcoming Bishop Richard Pates. Thank you, Gail. Very much appreciate your kind introduction and really feel tremendously honored 
be a participant in the uh, company of Sister Simone Campbell in this uh, fourth annual Venenga Lecture. The series, as we've just heard, pays tribute to Jim Venenga, founder of the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service. Jim's legacy encouraging citizen involvement and literacy in the political and civil institutions of our society lives on, hopefully, a little bit in this lecture series. Moreover, insights from the religious perspective add a richness, I would suggest, that goes beyond the immediate issues and offers an opportunity for reflection and time-tested dimension to all of our considerations. I am especially grateful to Eric Giordano for extending the invitation to be with you and to Gail Kell, who has attended to all of the organizational details of getting here from Des Moines, getting back and all of that sort of thing, and had a wonderful opportunity to be in Green Bay this morning. Originally from Minnesota, I must express some trepidation in being with you. Truth, <laughs> truth be told, I bleed purple, and therefore <laughs> hope my words won't experience some blockage here in Packerland. Huh? So I suggested today that um, Brett Favre might be considered a link for all of us. You know, we're looking for bridges. <laughs> and we probably would wholeheartedly endorse that, uh, uh, Brett, if it weren't for that one errant pass huh? in the playoff games when they were going for the possibility of the Super Bowl and the Vikings would be there. But we have to have a forgiving heart and to move on here. Uh, the people in Green Bay weren't quite up to that whole suggestion or idea this morning. But um, we hope that the Vikings might be somewhat competitive in their new billion dollar U.S. Bank Stadium. And so that's probably a whole social justice issue unto itself. Huh? <laughs> to spend a billion dollars on a stadium. Given my role as a Roman Catholic bishop, much of what I will say this evening comes from that perspective. I hope that listeners from other backgrounds can reasonably adapt to it from their own rich legacy, and I appreciate your understanding in that regard. In January, I had the opportunity to participate in an international gathering of Catholic bishops in Lisbon, Portugal. The conference was sponsored by the Acton Institute of Grand Rapids, Michigan, on the topic of the intersection between the free market and Catholic social justice teaching. I was the only American bishop there. The majority of the group were from Africa and Central and South America. Upon learning that I was from Iowa, they immediately engaged conversation on the American elections, particularly since the Iowa caucuses were right around the corner. First of all, they were astounded at the tenor of the political conversation and how negative they felt it was in terms of the candidates' positions for U.S. office and the presidency. It seemed distant to them, it seemed distant from the expected appreciation of a people who are the wealthiest ever in history. Moreover, the proposed resolution of significant problems by aspiring leaders was, from their perspective, bellicose and dependent on military force. My friends asked of me, had we Americans not heard of Pope Francis? Had we of Christian persuasion not been challenged by the path of dialogue? What does the Holy Father mean when he constantly affirms, they said, we are one human family. We are all brothers and sisters. The bishops almost in chorus emphasized how important the American elections are, for they establish a direction for the rest of the world with implications for pursuing a sustainable peace and grappling with widespread hunger and poverty and the huge migrations of peoples, especially those running from the inferno of Iraq and Syria. The lights, therefore, I would suggest, are shining on us. We Americans are being called to incorporate our Christian values and beliefs into the political process in a manner that best reflects what serves not only our own immediate needs, but the perspective of the human scene. But we protest, given the current positions of the two major parties, that when interspersed with our religious convictions, don't a preponderant majority of us have difficulty in finding a comfortable home in either major party, whether it be Democrat or Republican, but the privilege of civic participation and voting and the responsibility we hold for the common good leave 
no alternative. We must engage, but how? We need to articulate core principles that serve as a foundation for our position that also, I would suggest, coincide with the natural law. That law which is embedded in our souls, in our very bones, which the U.S. Declaration of Independence describes as truths that are self-evident. My international friends made reference to Pope Francis. Everywhere I go, the Pope is admired for his authenticity and genuine humility. The remarkable media coverage that he received in his September U.S. visit clearly demonstrates the influence he wields. Even our pol polarized politicians took on a listening mode. I don't believe it is an exaggeration to identify him, really, as far as I travel, as everyone's Pope not only for us Catholics alone. I've had the opportunity on two occasions to meet him. One was in Rio de Janeiro for World Youth Day, and he was celebrating Mass with all the bishops that were there, as well as the priests in the cathedral there in Rio de Janeiro. And I was sitting in a, or standing with a group, sitting, I guess, with a group of Italian bishops, and the Italian bishops tend to be a little pushy, you know? And so they said, oh, the you know, Santa Padre, arriva in questa parte, huh? So they said the, part, the Pope's going to come in this part, and then he's going to walk across. So they shoved us all right up to the front of the, uh, where the Pope was going to pass. And sure enough, he came in, and then he took a left and went right by. And thanks to the Italians, I was there right in the front row. So he came, and he recognized a fellow to my right, I think was uh, uh, South American. And then I came, and knowing that he doesn't speak English, tried to speak a little Italian to him. But I think once he looked at me, and he had very quizzical and he shook my hand very warmly, and this listened to that Italian, and kind of had a quizzical look on my face when I described Iowa as part of the United States. Smiled nicely, moved on, didn't say a word. But the next fellow that he met uh, was a friend of his, Eduardo, come esta? How are you, Eduardo? Haven't seen you far. What are you doing here anyway, Eduardo? You know. So he was very, very uh, loquacious and very pleasant with that individual. Then in Rome, I was there about a year or so ago, and when we're in Rome, the bishops are allowed to sit on the platform with him at the general audiences and then to go up and greet him. And so at that time, I did go up and greet him and just one on one. And he's extraordinarily gracious. He just lights up the room, lights up the place. And he has a very, his charm is much more accentuated in person than even we see in the pictures in the movies. And takes particular attention and gave a very warm, friendly greeting and a little visit for two minutes. And puts his hand on your shoulder and grabs your hand and all of that sort of thing. So he is a person who has a great deal of charisma, and I think that his authenticity, there's no doubt about it, that this is who he is and what he is all about. And so tonight I would propose to address three mega issues that Pope Francis has latched onto. The first, and this would be to an extended degree, the environment, and then to a lesser extent, peace and the economy. I contend that these three questions should also be high on the writer screen as we evaluate the presidential campaigns. So hopefully we can elevate those issues maybe and get the uh, politicians' attention. The signature writing that has catapulted the Pope center stage on global issues is Laudato Si. His, encycl his encyclical on the environment, published on June 18th, 2015, it'll be about a year and just a month or so, and its subtitle is Care for Our Common Home. His message is clearly a call to action. In effect, he states that Mother Earth, our home, is on fire. The scientific, the scientific facts, he concludes, are beyond dispute. We need to take action before the house is beyond salvaging, which in fact is not that distant. Moreover, we are responsible for the fate of future generations. Laudato Si, conceived within the framework of human and environmental ecology, is a clarion call for universal action to reverse ailing Mother Earth's health condition. Evidence abounds. Pollution and waste. Widespread experience of radical climate variation. Reduction of safe water, which is the stuff of life. And loss of biodiversity. More distressing is the impact on human life, where the poor suffer intolerably and societies and cultures are unraveling. At the heart of this environmental disruption is that which has been called climate change. In this, the Pope concurs 
with a preponderant analysis of 97% of the actively publishing climate scientists. This change in large measure occurs when greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, methane, nitrogen oxides, and others, concentrate as a result of human activity. Cited especially are the use of coal, oil, and gas, coupled with deforestation and clearing of, resor of the resources which help maintain the equilibrium in the atmosphere by absorbing excessive carbon that is being produced. This greenhouse effect traps heat in a so-called ceiling that increases temperatures, which in turn has a significant impact on the pattern of the climate, the form of water, and the sustainability of microorganisms and other impressions of life, which contribute to the balance of nature and its sustainability. The balance that is essential, therefore, for continuation of all forms of life, and or they will be shut down. It is true that the crisis has come about because of human action. The Pope contends the undergirding of this debilitating movement is supported by an anthropocentric philosophy. All is simply at the disposition of human desire. Contrary to the Christian vision, as so beautifully and poetically espoused by St. Francis of Assisi, which regards all creation as God's gift to be reverenced and enjoyed within the framework of preserving and sustaining it, this outlook basically holds that the earth and all of nature exist for human use, thus justifying and encouraging its exploitation. It is a system that promotes endless consumption of material goods with the assumption that such a way of life will bring happiness. What is occurring is the world is being used up. There will be little, if anything, left for the benefit of generations to follow us. Nonetheless, it is in our working together that can turn the tide and avoid cat catastrophe and preserve the remarkable beauty we have inherited. The Pope leads us to a hopeful perspective that should galvanize us into action based on a love of creation, of nature, and its beauty in and unto itself. Cited as among the leading culprits in the climate crisis is carbon dioxide. In the Pope's view, reached with the input of knowledgeable experts, two significant uh, factors must be addressed. The use of fossil fuels and wide swaths of deforestation wiping out indispensable carbon dioxide-hungry trees. The miracle is that both of these processes can be reversed through human ingenuity. I admit to being somewhat biased, but do you know that amid American energy, which supplies our power in Iowa, has definitive plans to expand the production of renewable energy in Iowa to 85% of need in the near term with the additional investment of $3.8 billion in wind power. So within four years, 85% of our energy in Iowa will be coming from renewable energy from wind power. An industry employing thousands of workers has blossomed in the production of the windmills. Further economic development occurs in the manufacturing, transporting, installing, and then maintaining these machines, which take advantage of a plentiful Iowa resource, and that is wind. In addition, Technological companies such as Google and Facebook, which consume endless supplies of energy, have opted green and are establishing operations in Iowa because of the plentiful ability, I mean availability, of renewable energy. Both the environment, and very strongly emphasize also the economy, are beneficiaries of this development. The future is to be found in universal resources the wind, and the sun. The second cause of growing carbon dioxide is deforestation. Much of this phenomenon is attributed to the expanding population due now to reach 9 billion people in 2050. In this scenario, it is contended trees need to give way to food production. But wait a minute. Do you know how much food is wasted? The crops spoiled before getting from field to market and the food that is scraped off our plates amounts to 40% of total food production. 
Shimon Peres, the remarkable Israeli statesman and humanitarian, has begun a study center located near Tel Aviv, Israel. It, it has three goals. One, to develop a process of recycling food. Secondly, to obtain medicines from natural sources rather than chemical. And thirdly, to desalinate water. Perez contends trees can be spared. People can eat and not only survive, but thrive if they address this, this utilization of reducing, of, I mean, of uh, not using food, of squashing food uh, production and consumption. The quality of the life will be enhanced. A Jewish scientist by the name of Daniel Hillel has invented drip irrigation that produces food with a bare minimum of precious water, drip by drip. So they are exploring through human ingenuity how we can produce just with the food we waste, serve the human need, and also be very conservative of our water, which is so precious. Another bright light elucidating the future is the World Food Prize, located in Des Moines, established by Norman Borlaug, who is credited with saving a billion lives. It espouses the green revolution, developing crops and agricultural methods that will be able to produce enough food in comfortable quantities again to feed these nine billion Earth's residents and again forego the smelling of our forests. As we seek re resolution to the situation, Pope Francis recognizes the current ecological crisis as global in nature. The Vatican joined with other world representatives in the Paris summit at the end of 2016 to solicit commitments of all nations to address the global reality. Laudato C reads, enforceable international agreements are urgently needed since local authorities are not always capable of effective intervention. The Holy See has exerted its influence on the international level by its interventions and advocacy, strong advocacy at the Paris Conference. In doing so, it emphasizes that all of the world needs to be on the same page and committed to those policies and action intended for the beneficial global outcome of all. In affirmation of the agreement on climate change at the Paris Conference, Pope Francis on January 11th stated, this significant accord represents for the entire international community an important achievement. It reflects a powerful collective realization of the grave responsibility incumbent on individuals and nations to protect creation, to promote a culture of care that permeates all of society. In analyzing the climate crisis, the Pope notes that the suffering cause is not shared proportionately. Thus, the Pope clearly states that we are called to be attentive to the three billion persons who are suffering and are left behind in a proportionate sharing of God's providence. They represent what Pope Francis terms the throwaway culture. One of the ways their lives can be enhanced, their God-given dignity recognized and respected, is by reversing the suffering emanating from en environmental degradation. The goods of the world necessary for survival, indeed the flourishing of human nature, are intended for universal application. They are not to be hoarded by a select minority. St. John Chrysostom brings this principle into clear focus. He asserts that if I wear one pair of shoes and have another in the closet, that which is in the closet belongs to the poor man who has no shoes. It is essential, Pope Francis asserts, to seek comprehensive solutions which consider the interactions within natural systems themselves and with social systems. We are faced not with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather with one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. Strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, protecting nature. At a certain point, some claim that as early as 2075, the damage to the environment may be irreversible. We must pay forward to future generations, providing them a home that will be habitable, preserving the wonder of God's goodness. We should do so 
because we can do it. In response to the welcome at the White House on September 23rd, during, during his visit to the United States, Pope Francis stated, Mr. President, I find it encouraging that you are proposing an initiative for reducing air pollution. Accepting the urgency, it seems clear to me also that climate change is a problem that can no longer be left to a future generation. When it comes to the care of our common home, we are living at a critical moment of history. We still have time to make the changes needed to bring about a sustainable and integral development, for we know things can change. We are all born into life on this planet. This common home is an unmerited gift. Through creation, God has provided for us an abundant earth and a gracious and full mother. Earth's, hell is, Earth's health is imperiled by a relational breakdown with God, with fellow humans, and with the planet itself. Our faith and the common relationship with one another impel us to address this situation. Our destiny is intertwined, Earth and each human person on a common journey. For the Christian, this is in unity with Christ who leads us to the goal of creation, life-giving unity with the Father. To arrive at this goal, Pope Francis accentuates the reality that all of creation is in communion. Echoing St. Francis of Assisi, the Holy Father proclaims, everything is related, and we human beings are united as brothers and sisters on a wonderful pilgrimage, woven together by the love of God has for each of his creatures, and which also unites us in fond affection with Brother Sun, Sister Moon, Brother River, and Mother Earth. The Pope insists that the natural environment is a collective good, the patrimony of all humanity and the responsibility of everyone. Our work is to ensure justice and a livable situation for everyone represents fidelity to the Creator since God created the world for everyone. In considering the primacy of the human person in creation, those activities which diminish the dignity of each human person are to be challenged, especially is this so with the emerging supremacy of technology. This development gives rise to a practical relativism, which translates, if it can be done, do it. Importantly, as we pursue material progress, we must adhere to the requirement to provide work for people to enable them to achieve the meaning and purpose God has in mind for them, core to the hierarchy of values. Moving forward with environmental conversion, Pope Francis employs a word characteristic of his papacy, and that word is dialogue. This dialogue, incur this dialogue occurs on an international scale on the national and local scene. It emphasizes transparency in decision-making in politics, in economy, and religious dialogue with science. In all of these formats, the key is transparency, openness, and a commitment to reach resolutions that are in the best interests of each of us individually and as one human family. Such conversion or change requires us to think of the preservation of that which gives life, air, water, fertile soil. We can do so by being responsible in our own situation, but also by joining together in advocacy of those policies that will characterize us as grateful stewards so that all God so lovingly created might thrive. Let me again at this point to brag about my home state. Iowans have been especially blessed and inspired by leaders who are able to parse the grammar of responsible stewardship. Farmer after farmer who visit with me tell me that they are committed to leaving the soil and the water for which they are responsible in much better shape than they inherited it. As noted earlier, wind power has taken off in Iowa. It is now the number two state in the United States producing more such energy per capita than any other state. Right behind is the installation of solar panels, especially in rural areas on the farms. The development of renewable energy creates jobs and produces clear, breathable air while enabling us to experience the custom lifestyle benefits. An example I'd like to cite in this regard is that of Justin Doyle, 
a Catholic engineer in Des Moines who is practical and committed toward healthy economic development. He transforms old buildings to renovation and very importantly, the installation of solar energy, which is sustainable and very economic operationally. Outright energy returns in one of his mid-sized renovated industrial office buildings are $120 in monthly rebates. So he has no cost to pay and he gets $120 a month back from the energy company. The Pope challenges us, therefore, to dedicate efforts for change on the personal level also, over which we have control, and then on the ever-expanding citizen level, which calls for us to become coalitions of influence. Independent undertakings, which he, under, which he advocates, include avoiding the use of plastic and paper, reducing water consumption, separating refuse, cooking only what can be reasonably consumed, showing care for other human beings, using public transport or carpooling, planting trees, turning off unnecessary lights, or any number of practices. It is reasonable to ask, has there been any noticeable effective change by these individual actions? The Holy Father notes, people may well have a growing ecological sensitivity, but it has not necessarily succeeded in changing their harmful habits of consumption, which, rather than decreasing, appear to be growing all the more. A simple example is the increasing use and power of air conditioning. In response to the need for policies that better care for God's creation, the Holy Father acknowledges that politicians will inevitably clash with the mindset of short-term gain and results, which dominates present-day economics and politics. He goes on to say, however, that politicians, and I quote, if they are courageous, will attest to their God-given dignity and leave behind a testimony of selfless responsibility. Moreover, the Pope asks God to enlighten those who possess power and money that they may avoid the sin of indifference, that they may love the common good, advance the weak, and care for the world in which we live. Simply put, Pope Francis recognizes that the defense of our common home concurrently requires both strong public policies and intrepid leaders committed to justice and to the common good of all, and especially those dedicated to the poor, the vulnerable, and the marginalized. The individual action in climate change needs to evolve to embrace political consensus. That is where progress will be achieved for the common good. It is on such issues that politicians should be coaxed to rise above political advantage based on somewhat convoluted differentiation, namely wedge issues, and be committed to achieving the common good. It is here where Christian citizens join together on issues which need to be addressed by both parties in the interest of all God's children. It is in finding common ground in questions of universal application that we will be able to move forward in authentic human advancement. Thus, in this political season, it is up to us citizen, Pope Francis insists, to look beyond narrow interests to bring about the common good. He says, unless citizens control power, national, regional, and municipal, it will not be possible to control damage to the environment. Climate change, the common good, a 2015 April statement of the Pontifical Academy of Science pushes us dedicated to the moral good. Over, it reads, over and above institutional reforms, policy changes, and technological in innovations for affordable ac access to renewable energy sources, there is a fundamental need to reorient our attitude toward nature and thereby toward ourselves. Finding ways to develop a sustainable relationship with nature requires not only the engagement of scientists, political leaders, educators, and civil societies, but will succeed only if it is based on a moral revolution that religious institutions are in a special position to promote. Praise be to you as an encyclical is not a political document, nor a scientific document, but rather a religious document which our Holy Father, Pope Francis, has developed to guide us in the moral order, that we might be faithful to the scriptures and the teachings of the churches in our times. From a Christian humanist perspective, we pray. May it inspire us to unite in generating hope 
and in building the kingdom of God, indeed be about building a safe and healthy haven for all of us in the human family. And now I'd like to address two other questions that are so much in the for forefront of the Holy Father's communications. The very first is that of peace. So a second area which Pope Francis has dedicated a great deal of effort is to is that of seeking concord throughout the world. It is the understanding of being one human family that has driven the vision of Pope Francis to overcome debilitating separation and bring people to the table of peace. It is the same vision that has led the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops to advocate for renewing diplomatic relations and completely ending the embargo in Cuba, and also reaching agreement with Iran on the non-development of that country's nuclear bomb capability. Representatives of the U.S. bishops went to Iran in March of 2014 to the city of Qom at the invitation of Shia leaders to discuss the common understanding that our faith, Catholic and Shia Islam, share. We are very warmly and cordially received. Our goal was to come to an agreement from a moral perspective on the utilization of nuclear weapons with the hope that we, in turn, might influence political leaders of our respective countries. The outcome of our talks was that both faiths hold that the utilization of nuclear weapons is immoral. This is based on the indiscriminate nature of these weapons and their potential for widespread and intolerable destructions. The Iranians and we representatives of the USCCB are scheduled to meet again in Rome June 2nd to the 6th. This time, the focal point of the talks will be terrorism. Coming together has brought about a further appreciation for each other's faith and the impact we can have in our home countries for our mutual benefit. Diplomacy, negotiation, and most importantly, as Pope Francis insists, dialogue are far better than hostility and separation. Divisions of people create fear and negativity and shroud the goodness in every human heart. The Berlin Wall, for instance, perpetuated the artificial separation of two peoples, extending tension and political conflict. In fact, it is described as a Cold War. Aware of that history, as Pope Francis recently said, we don't need more walls. A wall between Mexico and the United States would proclaim loudly of our inability to resolve such issues as immigration, our country's insatiable appetite for drugs, the ensuing corruption and widespread violence, and the unraveling of education in Latin America. The Holy Father has said a Christian is one who builds bridges, not walls. In his visit last year to the Central African Republic, the Pope raised the consequential role of weapons merchants who do lucrative business in supplying death machines to opposing military factions, often purely mercenary, in very stressed countries, and who do not have the common good at heart. Con con conversation of, poetic, of weapons, rather, raises the dark specter of American mass violence. It also brings to mind our continuing development, production, and maintenance of nuclear weapons to the tune of hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. Their only value, never to be used. These threats to our humanity demand religious as well as common sense responses. When I reflect on Christians enabling peace, I recall a United Nations official from Benin who was in charge of rehabilitation in Cote d'Ivoire after its recent civil war. He demonstrated convictions and values at the heart of our Christian ethic. These were forgiveness, justice, compassion, dialogue, new beginnings, dissolving sentiments of hatred. When I expressed admiration for his putting into practice his convictions, he simply replied, I am a Christian, and my faith compels me, compels me to such action expressing the love of Christ. And the third instance of the concern of the Holy Father is that of the economy. What are we going to do about the poor? Pope Francis asked in response to an invitation to the Davos Conference on Economic Activity in January. The question epitomizes the Pope's deeply seated concern. His question is well grounded in the Gospels, in his cultural heritage of South America, and in the Catholic Church's preferential option for the poor. 
In his September talk to the U.S. Congress, the Pope urged the lawmakers to, and I quote, keep in mind all those people around us trapped in a cycle of poverty. They need, too, to be given hope. The fight against poverty, poverty must be fought consistently and in many fronts, especially in its causes. And he added, it goes without saying that part of this great effort is the creation and distribution of wealth the right use of natural resources, the proper application of technology, and the harnessing of the spirit of enterprise are essential elements of an economy that seeks to be modern, inclusive, and sustainable. As we engage economic issues, we identified with David, we identify with David as he battled Goliath. There are 62 billionaires in the world who have the aggregate wealth of 3.6 billion, or approximately half the world's inhabitants combined. Furthermore, the conditions which the poor live under, lack of education, joblessness, hunger, malnutrition, poor health, and inadequate housing, lack of proper sanitation, corruption, poor government, et cetera, et cetera, seem insurmountable. But our Christian convictions tell us we should engage in resolution without hesitation or fear. In facing these seemingly impossible tasks, we find encouragement from Mother Teresa, on DACA to be proclaimed a saint in this jubilee of mercy, when asked how she was going to take care of the millions upon millions of the poor, she replied simply, one person at a time. This talk is billed as the utilization of our conscience that of a Christian conscience, or even a deeply held humanitarian conscience, in exercising responsible activity on behalf of the polis, of the city, of the common good. The foregoing considerations speak of three dimensions, care for our common home, peace, and the economy, which Pope Francis has raised as central to the common good and the pursuit of justice in our time, thereby ensuring, hopefully, the inherent dignity of every person. Legitimately, we ask, but what is conscience? How does it come to be? And I will try to spell out a Catholic understanding of conscience, but trust it has applicability beyond our Catholic ken. The Second Vatican Council elaborated on the nature of conscience. It defined it as the most secret core and sanctuary of a person where one is alone with God, whose voice echoes in one's depths. There, a person detects a law which one does not impose on oneself, but which holds one in obedience. Always summoning the person to live good and avoid evil, the voice of conscience, when necessary, speaks to the heart, saying, do this, shun that. That is to say, conscience is where a person discovers in the heart a law written by God, which is fulfilled by, law, by love of God and neighbor. Guided by conscience, persons employ reason to judge the moral quality of a concrete act that one is going to perform or has already completed. In all one says and does, a person is obliged to follow faithfully what one knows to be just and right. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has outlined how the person exercises the responsibility to judge rightly by forming one's conscience for a political choice. It is, in, it is summarized in four steps, which I now outline. The very first, each person must, be, must begin being open to the truth and what is right. In essence, that requires each of us to set aside our partisan perspectives, whether it might be from CNN, Fox News, or Rush Limbaugh. We are to forego ideological biases and approach issues and situations with authentic openness of mind and heart. Number two, each of us must carefully and regularly study scripture in classic fonts of human wisdom. We should reflect every day on authentic inspiration to serve the common good. And the third, the third element of conscious formation entails examination of the objective facts, data, and options that pertain to a particular decision. We are expected to avoid narratives from biased commentators and seek objective, thoughtful reflections from trusted analysts who are not swayed by any sort of special interest 
or agenda. Frequently occurring in our day, Pope Francis asserts in Laudato Si, and he says, and I quote, there are too many special interests and economic interests who easily end up trumping the common good and manipulating information so that their plans will not be affected. And finally, four, for the believer, we are called to prayerfully reflect in order to discern the divine will in a particular situation. We are invited to bring our openness, reflections, and examination to quiet reflection and be open to God's spirits to enlighten our hearts and minds of how to act. Employing our consciences together in common cause could have a powerful effect on our corporate future. As we reflect upon our political responsibility and employ our consciences in determining the route we choose, perhaps beyond our voting is the call to be of exercising ongoing influence on our culture. As my international bishop friends so directly reminded me in Lisbon, all of us today live in a global society. We have responsibility for the evolving relationship that bind us together. And for us Americans, we are reminded, to those to whom much is given, much will be expected. Can we serve to reanimate the generous and altruistic American traits that have characterized us Americans at our best? Exemplified, for instance, in the Marshall Plan, the Peace Corps, the extraordinary compassionate responses to international natural disasters. Though frustration inevitably emerges from the current political turmoil, we should continue to reform political parties from the inside, which could, if well-directed, achieve most of what is at stake for the common good. At the same time, often it will be necessary to rise above party limitations and join in a united front. In doing so, we are to pursue the path of wisdom and the gospel te teachings, which recognize the inestimable value of each human person and render to that person the life and dignity to which he or she is entitled as a child of God. As Pope Francis continually insists, we are one human family. We are all brothers and sisters. So thank you for listening. So now we have uh, some microphones to go around and invite your uh, comments, also your suggestions, your ideas, whatever you'd like to say, or questions. Be happy to entertain your uh, kind of take on everything. Yes, thank you. Uh, one important part, I think, of, of um, climate change is the population. Uh, you didn't address that. Uh, do you want me to elaborate, or should you? Well, I think that uh, from a certain perspective, I think it's uh, basically the issue which I try to emphasize in deforestation that you know, and what uh, the um, Paris is doing and the others are doing is that they're productive of the food for everybody. There could be enough room and space and breathable air for everybody if we take those uh, and move in that direction. So I don't think uh, population in 2050 at the population can be sustained and healthy if we take reasonable, strong steps for, uh, it's, uh, for the uh, you know, breathable air, which you've discussed there, and also, I think, the issue of deforestation. So there are many strategies that can go forward with respect to the human person without necessarily uh, eliminating human population. That's the perspective we come from. OK. How many people there are is not the total answer to the problem. We have people who, like the 62 billionaires you mentioned, many people who are well off, who consume much more of the Earth's good than the new babies in India, China, Africa. Right, I think that's part of the problem that the Pope says is that the goods of the world are entitled for everybody and that everybody should have a justifiable, you know, uh, opportunity to benefit from those goods and it's disproportionate in the world today 
And so we have to begin to say that it's not an absolute right to have all of those material benefits. So I think you're right in what you're saying is uh, directly related also uh, part of the response that I didn't give there, but I think you're correct there. Okay, there we are right in the middle. Thank you. Um, the church used to take a pretty bold stance on profiting off of people lending money. Um, and now we know that debt is a huge issue uh, for, the, for economic health. Uh, we have college students that are in massive debt. Uh, we have countries that are going into foreclosure. We have territories that are in debt. Uh, is, is the church going to come out again on, uh, on, a, on a stance on what is a moral way to lend people money and how to not or make profit off of that process? I think uh, already the Pope has addressed it in some uh, legitimate ways. He really espouses an economy that de develops into sustainable uh, ongoing economic activity and not just one that uh, is, is you saying lending people for money, not having any ultimate productivity in terms of the human good. So I think he's addressed that and has conti continues to address the illegitimacy, so to speak, of taking advantage of people in those situations. So there has to be a just limitation that there can be obviously the lending of money, but it has to be uh, you know, somehow uh, organized and I think uh, regulated to a certain degree. So yes, the church content, I would say, would continues to hold that very strongly, but that's a very good point. Okay, there, our friend, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say kudos to Iowa for the work that they've done in moving towards um, renewable energy as a large portion of their energy um, production. Um, I guess I'm curious about the um, particular, um, I guess, strategies or um, political will that was able to uh, make that happen. And then do you see any... Um, hope or what specific strategies can we take from Iowa to apply on a national level? Well, I think, uh, you know, that the, it came to the um, that different political parties uh, shifted power during certain periods of time, and uh, there was one that couldn't see the value of it, then another party got that was put in, in, uh, in, in power there. And so then they began to have these uh, smaller uh, attempts at, uh, you know, building these uh, windmills, et cetera, and gradually they saw the value of it. And I think also uh, Mr. Buffett owns Mid-American Energy, basically, I think. He saw the value of investing in it and I think had a great influence in the state at that time. And so it just took off from there that they once they saw the value of it and all of a sudden these attractions of uh, companies that are coming their way, um, Google and that sort of thing, they said, well, we want to take advantage of this renewable energy. They were using so much of it, but we cannot really morally think of using that, which is going to produce more carbon and that sort of thing. So they, I think it was kind of a wake-up call for everybody of the value. And then secondly, they saw the uh, industrial development of all of these uh, apparatus that are, you know, the big windmills themselves, the maintaining and the, the transporting, of it, that this became a very uh, economically strong, positive development in the state. So I think all of this came together, and uh, in a certain sense, there wasn't necessarily a defined strategy, but it, it happened, and now both parties say, wasn't well, this wonderful? <laughs> and this is to all of our benefit. So I think you just have to keep proposing it and, and uh, going through it and encouraging. You know, it's not only the government that did it. Obviously, this was a private enterprise, mid-American, uh, mid and then, you know, uh, Google and all those are all private enterprises, which are pushing the development of the renewable energy, too because they see the great benefit from it. So it's not only purely government or systems organized per se, but those who are doing it for their own sort of sense of development and benefit, but are doing it kind of from an enlightened perspective. So it's all of, all of the people coming together. So, you know, you could write your power companies too <laughs> and encourage them and uh, not, deply, uh, not depend only on the political process because I think there's a lot of goodwill among a lot of uh, American uh, corporations we're really looking to invest in a way that's uh, uh, really laudable and I think responsible. So it's a lot of things that came together, a lot of forces. 
Okay, would you like to say some things? So we got two, they're right there together in the front here. All right. I would just like to make a comment about population. It's not necessarily a question. I think uh, as Americans who use so many resources, so much more than the rest of the world, have no right, as long as we use that much resources, to tell the other world that the world that the population is too big is getting too big. Once we share enough with poor countries, then maybe we can talk about population. Okay, thank you. I'm having trouble uh, trying to phrase this exactly, but um, one of the things that you brought up earlier was the admonition to not let our, um, our voting or our political activism be um, just focused on wedge issues, but that we have to look at the common good. And with so much um, po polarization, I guess, uh, within even within our own church, within our own families, among the bishops even. Uh, for example, um, social justice is seen as sort of a, a bad thing in, in a lot of circles, and even in perhaps sometimes even in this diocese so that uh, an organization that's trying to promote social justice is considered threatening. And, and how do you deal with that, I mean, among the bishops, or suggest that we could in our own families to bring um, attention more to that common good? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for that question. You know, I don't sense it so much among us American bishops. I mean, there are some who, you know, there's always uh, kind of the old bell curve, so you have some on one side or the other. But I think uh, down the middle that most of the bishops recognize, and especially under the leadership of Pope Francis, that he has been really extraordinarily clear about this. I think it's uh, taken some time to absorb his uh, understanding and teaching because it's a little bit of a shift. But I think that they're coming down recognizing that, you know, basically it's Christian charity. Justice is based on the dignity of every human person. And so we have to really work uh, to develop that and to sustain that. So I think that there's a growing realization of appreciation for that. Uh, within the context of the American bishops themselves. And so they, you know, are kind of coming along, understanding it, and uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, applaud a lot of the use. One of the big issues is immigration, and there's no stronger, I think, unity among the American bishops than, you know, the insistence on justice for all of the immigrants and working together with that. I think also that they're beginning to see, you know, the worldwide issues related to poverty and how we have to address those. and be you know, firm, I think, as you stated so beautifully, that we Americans utilize so much more um, you know, of the world's goods disproportionately, and not to really for advantage of happiness, I don't think, it's just the consumerism, rampant consumerism, that uh, tells us we need all this sort of thing. And then we take all of that and uh, utilize you know, and contribute so much more to the carbon reality of the world. So the question becomes, and I don't want to, it, too, too long in this situation, but the other world doesn't use half as that much, you know, and so are we wanting to change even the population issue for the benefit of ourselves to have more and more quality? I mean, can we phrase it or look at it in that way also? And so I think, um, you know, the bishops are coming to a realization of that justice. I think you have to have dialogue. I think you also have to speak the truth. You have to speak it, genu you know, genuinely, kindly, understandingly, not to get in great big partisan, you know, fights, and I think we have to uh, speak to the shallowness oftentimes of our American politics today and the wedge issues and all that sort of thing, where they use them to divide people to get votes but do nothing about it ultimately, you know. And so we just have to be strong and state our viewpoint and be willing to share that without being, you know, I think difficult in other people and uh, being too harsh on them because that way we're polarizing, we're agents of polarization rather than trying to bring people together. So, you know, and I think it's unfortunate that sometimes politicians will tap into anger or a vein of all this sort of thing and not really help that anger, overcome that anger, but uh, what are we gonna to do to really, you know, make America strong and good for the benefit of service to the rest of the world? And I think that's what the Pope is really, the Pope and a lot of people from South America, mostly not so much from Africa, have that sense that here's this big, huge giant consuming all the world's goods, 
and not really having you know a sense of justice for the rest of the world. So that's why they say that we are so important in our elections to have this viewpoint and this vision, which would be a benefit of service for the common good. And that's why the Pope keeps insisting we're one human family. <laughs> it's not just Americans, not just you know the South Americans, but all of us working together for the justice of all. Okay, are there some other questions? Okay, we're in the back there, they're great. Okay, thank you. I guess right here too, we'll go back, get back there in a few minutes. Um, what percentage of US bishops would you say have the same mind thought as you do in this global climate change subject as far as um, encouraging priests to preach homilies and stuff? Because if we're going to build this from the bottom up, does the Catholic, you, the Catholic bishops, do they realize what power they have in that, in a non-political way, they can get people aware of just how dire we are in this subject? Because if you only go by the political, you have so many top political people who just don't even believe in climate change. So. To me, if you build from the bottom up, the priests and bishops in this country have a unique opportunity to try to build this recognition. Good. Well, I think you point out one important thing is that, you know, for our priests, that they don't like to have controversy <laughs> necessarily in their parishes, you know. So how they're going to present that in a way that somehow brings people together with a greater understanding, which you talk about, is really a continuing challenge for all of us that if they go in there and they have great big polarization within the parish, that that's not really what they're about either. So how you have to bring that about with an understanding of a basic human need, the common good, the principles that we all attribute to social justice, people understand that and understand suffering and difficulty and problems. And if you can enable them to relate to that and to understand that, then I think people will gradually change. I agree with you 100% that this has to be a grassroots movement that the ultimate power resides with the people themselves, with the desire to have a change. And you know, sometimes politicians put their fingers in the air and what way the wind is blowing, that's the way they kind of talk, you know? And so I think we have to, uh, we can have a terrific impression. So uh, I think bishops, uh, you know, especially as they uh, grasp and understand more and more uh, the leadership of Pope Francis, as they are emboldened by him, I think they understand and appreciate what he has to say and they're uh, just gradually finding their voice of how to speak about this, how to bring it about, how to do so without you know, polarization and all that sort of thing and to somehow uh, grab that. So we're trying to encourage our priests to do the same thing. And for instance, um, our clergy conference next year will be uh, the call of Laudato Si and the, um, you know, the encouragement and the voice of Pope Francis leading us on. So we're trying to bring this about among our clergy in Des Moines of how we understand where we're moving in direction, understanding, let them talk about it themselves because they will be supportive of one another as we bring that about. So it's important because there isn't a lot of time left, but how you also get a real foundation for priests and bishops, et cetera, to talk, we have to discover that. We have to keep working at it, keep talking about it. It's really important so that they can see. I, I think that some people don't see the urgency of it, and yet the, the scientists are so pretty clear about it. And you know, we love the. And I think the practical realization, loving the future generation, giving a better place for others, is also something that pulls us. We love our children, <laughs> we love our grandchildren, <laughs> and so we want the best for them. This is, I think, what's on the table. You know, that if we don't act, then so th that's some of the themes. And I think also yourselves. You can talk, uh, I think, in the parishes. They said, how do you get this out in a parish? Well, I would suggest that if you're a member of a parish or um, you know, whatever parish, it doesn't have to be Catholic, you know, there's probably five or six people in your community who have real strong convictions and passion about this. If they can get together and just develop a little bit of strategy, understanding, recognition, not only saying that it's dependent on the priest or the bishop, but we have a teaching in the church called census fidelium, the sense of the faithful. Huh? which is an extraordinarily important dimension of the formulation of our theology. And so if that gets started down there, and that's encouraging, and as they spread it without, as I say, polarization, that's a hard thing to do, 
then I think it can have the grassroots effect too. So it's important for the bishops and the priests, and we're working on that, keep uh, developing it and our different strategies, but it's also important for all of you in your own parishes and communities to exercise the leadership, pull people together, and to recognize that even five or six working together and that strategy and over time can have a terrific impact. I think there was one question in the back there, no? Okay. I'm puzzled about one thing. Uh, is this something which only came to fruition under Pope Francis? Was this problem sort of ignored by Pope Benedict? No, you, that's a very good question, and I don't want to over, overly emphasize. It was uh, first brought to light by, actually, Pope John Paul II in its uh, current uh, understanding. He was, uh, he's been a very, he was a very strong leader also, but kind of in the analysis of this, of that this is coming, that we have to address it, and kind of from uh, a more uh, academic viewpoint, you know, teaching about it, understanding it. And certainly Pope uh, Benedict contributed significantly and beautifully to it from the religious perspective of the appreciation of God's creation. You know, he's got some beautiful, beautiful readings that are incorporated in that. But I think it kind of leads us to, uh, you know, an appreciation and understanding. But what Pope Francis has come about, it says he has been more insistent on action, that we have to do something. And he acknowledges, and I'm sorry I didn't treat that reality, of uh, the fact that both those two popes have set the stage for him and have done a beautiful job. So you have a great, <laughs> you're correct in being puzzled why I didn't meet, uh, mention that, you know. But that is very important to understand, too. So it's not just Pope Francis coming on the stage and being, uh, you know, inconsistent with what's gone before him, but he's really now at that point where he can really be very strong. He has a different approach to leadership and getting out there and speaking about it than the other two popes, but they certainly set the stage, and they were very, very strongly, you know, uh, advocates of moving forward and very concerned about climate change. And the destruction, just the, you know, the destruction that we see in the world today, that we're really using it up. And you see, um, you know, so many uh, situations which really are a degradation of the earth, Mother Earth, and all of that. And they were very strong in changing that and in challenging that. Okay, anything else? Anybody else would like to? Okay, right up here in front again. Okay, we got the three of you good uh, participants, huh? When Pope Francis addressed the issue of peace, uh, it, 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 it's occurred to me the antithesis of peace is violence. And America seems to have the, the monopoly, or maybe that's not the right word, but seems to have an obsession with, with, uh, with guns and uh, hiding behind the Second Amendment. And I'm just wondering whether the church is bold enough to address that obsession as it relates to peace and violence in America. Well, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I certainly try to do it <laughs> and encourage people in saying, you know, that uh, we have to be people and see the destruct destructive element of uh, guns, you know, that perhaps we can see for recreational use of hunting. That that's been a long-term, you know, experience and uh, popular, uh, you know, uh, episode for uh, people enjoying themselves, and I think that's justifiable. But we have to, we've gone be beyond that, and I think have to address it and, as I say, the weapons of war, too. You know, you go to a place like Central African Republic, and I've been there in Bangui where the Pope was, and he opened the Holy Year. Uh, and what the happens there is that they have wonderful cash, you know, they have a tremendous allotment of minerals that could make them, you know, uh, wealthy for dozens and dozens, scores of years. But what happens is people come in from the outside and create this turmoil and place, uh, then they get the, they bomb, <laughs> they bomb the Muslims, say the Catholics did it or the Christians did it, and they do just the opposite, and pretty soon, you know, they're going after each other. Then in the meanwhile, they scoop up all these minerals, put them in their back pocket, and they're off to, uh, you know, other places, and a huge, huge, uh, uh, you know, uh, caches of, uh, or cache, where they would have huge treasuries of all these uh, minerals, et cetera. So what they're doing is they're bringing them against each other, and the destruction is caused by these weapons, and the guns merchants, the gun merchants are the other ones who are really benefiting from it. And so that's what the Pope is trying to say, you know, is that this is always taking on the innocent for the benefit of some wealthy merchants 
who have no good in mind except their own you know, wealth and, and uh, power. So we have to face up to some of those issues and call them for what they are. And I think also here in the United States, you know, we made the, the brief reflect, uh, reference to that, is that there are so many guns, and who needs an AK-12 rifle in their home for self-defense? <laughs> who? I can't see anybody uh, that does that. And so I don't see the logic, and I, I don't see the justice, really, in terms of doing that. So Archbishop Supich of um, Chicago has spoken up about this, and I think some others have, too, you know, that we just have to see and to write and everything. But... People are so, you know, this is one issue that they really have strongly held convictions. It's really hard to move anybody off the dime who has this. And so everything else pales in comparison in terms of the political perspective except that one issue. So how we deal with it is we're going to have to have, you know, some strategy, talk about it and work on it and see what, what is going to really, you know, when you have all those little kids in Connecticut that were shot in those classrooms, well, just, that is insane. And how do we deal with it? And it's, you know, right, it's not uh, terrorists or anything else, you know, but guns should not be in the hands of people who can't use them well. Okay, way in the back there. I think I would really like to express my gratitude to you tonight for this wonderful speech that you just gave us to the Pope and to the wonderful people here in this room. A couple of years ago, I got involved with an organization called the Citizens Climate Lobby to do something about climate change. And so much of what we're about, I heard coming from your speech, and it led me to believe that, we, that there's a, spir a spirituality in this work that we're doing because we're all about building political consensus we're all about communicating with one another in a respectful way. Um, we're all about trying to create a sustainable future for our children on this amazing planet of ours. And I've never felt, I think, as inspired as I feel tonight listening to you, so thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you, and I think that's the important message we have to take home. We can do it. We have to support one another, and it can be accomplished. We cannot, uh, the good will prevail, I believe, but we have to have people who speak up and come together and encourage one another, too, uh, from a peaceful perspective to make that happen and not just react in terms of, you know, uh, polarization with polarization, but to see that the underlying that and the root of a Christian sometimes is we have, to, it might be a little painful, it might be a little suffering, but I agree with you that that's really what we're about, is we, to be encouraged and to see and firmly believe, I think, with the Pope and our Christian perspective, at least, is that the good will prevail. But if uh, people don't uh, speak up, then it's not going to have a chance. But if we do speak up, if we do move forward, we can accomplish this. And I think that's really what the Pope is trying to say, too. It's what we're, the state we're in is because of human activity. The state that can be will be because of human activity and that we can move in a good direction. And I think it's not out of a, a sense of judgment that we really try to do it of others, but really out of a sense of service and love. And I think that is one of the biggest uh, emphases of Pope Francis, too, is that we're not there to club the other or judge the other, but to invite them on a pathway that really leads to the benefit of all of us and out of a great spirit of love and charity. Okay, we got um, another uh, talk up here. Oh, one I, one? I would just like to thank you so much for calling attention to the need for people everywhere to get involved and do something and not depend on somebody else to do it. Um, somewhere along the line, I remember a quote that goes something like, bad things happen when good people do nothing. Um, and that happens when people depend on somebody else to take care of things for them. There are dozens of organizations out there that are committed to working on climate change. A few minutes on the internet will identify an organization that you can get involved with um, locally, statewide, nationally, whatever, but it needs to require some effort on everybody's part and not depend on somebody else. Okay, bravo. And I think that once we get involved in the reverberations, we share it with our family, we become excited, we become energetic about it, and I think that has a rippling effect too. So it's getting involved, but also it has a transformation with the individual being involved 
to even you know spread it in the local level, which is really where it's going to be effective also. I mean, our, our families, our friends, our people, <laughs> when we're excited about something, we share that news, that good effort. So I think it's got a double effect. What you're saying, everybody should do it, but then the benefit is that then once you become excited about something, you tell people about it and you invite them to share with you the, you know, the good effort. Okay, fine. Can you tell us what, um, um, you know, right now the Catholic Church seems to have the most publicity in terms of um, promoting the interests of our environment. Um, are you involved with other denominations at all in the United States um, regarding this issue? And if you are, could you share with us which ones those might be? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, in the United States, uh, I, I serve also on the board for Bread for the World. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a, basically uh, led by a Lutheran pastor. And uh, so they also see the, you know, it's all kind of one uh, global is issue kind of meld together in an integrated approach. And so, of course, their whole notion is to have no more hunger by the year 2030. And, uh, but what promotes hunger, what promotes poverty oftentimes, is uh, conflict. And so conflict uh, comes about when we don't, uh, when we're trying to, you know, make the world's goods for our use without uh, an idea of, you know, sharing them in terms of creation and beauty and they're open to everybody. So I think we're working together in that angle and uh, certainly a very powerful organization that I think has a lot of benefit and it's uh, ecumenical or even humanitarian might be the good reason. I think there's also um, other organizations we try to do with an ecumenical approach. Uh, we try to work closely in an emerging way with the Muslim community in the United States and also worldwide as they try to find a voice of unity for peace, non-terrorism, all of those sorts of things that are going to help us. There are any number of uh, Muslim clerics that we're aware of working with that are advocating that design, many more than you know, are the terrorists and those people. So how do, they, how do we support them so that their voice can be heard on a broader scale and uh, put down the terrorism, et cetera, that we expect? So there's all sorts of different angles that we're moving on. Uh, but I think the church perhaps has some advantage Sometimes it might be the people think it's a disadvantage, but you know, you have one, uh, the organizationally, it is structured in such a way that we have one leader, so to speak. All of us, you know, have our own voice, obviously, and it's not just that we march, uh, you know, lockstep, as they pointed out here, one after another, but I think that that organizational structure can also benefit from the grassroots all the way up throughout, you know, and that's everywhere, Africa, South America, Asia, United States, Europe to some degree. And so I think we're all trying to work with those uh, different organizations and the Pope, uh, and, and we too have great advocacy for the Paris Conference on the uh, climate, and that was universal. Uh, I think, you know, you know, again, all sorts of things under the banner of the UN coming together to work. So we're working on it, but I also encourage you, if you're a church-going person, you know, perhaps your own church, you could organize in this fashion too to kind of bring the attention to it. Or if you're not participating in a church, you can work within the humanitarian focus, et cetera, of people who share like-minded ideas with you and approach it from there. So yes, we do it working together. Hopefully we have the same vision that oftentimes, you know, all communities experience, you know, the old bell curve as uh, conservatives and liberals and all that sort of thing. And then how do we come to together to meet the future? So I'm again, very open and encourage wherever we can work with our partners in the ecumenical sphere and interfaith sphere, we should do so. And so take those opportunities. Today, perhaps because the Pope has that voice that somehow, you know, he wields tremendous influence. Uh, when you think he was here in the United States, from the moment he landed to the moment he left, there was almost constant coverage, you know, where else? No, no other topic is covered so directly, intensely for so long and positively, even the people who uh, are very, maybe very, um, you know, involved in the uh, uh, very classical uh, secular world really stopped and looked and listened at least for a while. It was amazing, I thought, 
that he was able to have such a focus. Only a natural disaster might <laughs> otherwise have such a focus. Good. Any other questions? Okay. I think, uh, okay, right in the middle here again. Okay, help us with our discussion. I just wanted to ask if your talk that you gave today, because I noticed you, you have it written, is it available um, for us to, to be able to share with our pastors, or is it available online somewhere? Or Right. Uh, I had, uh, I've written in a few things, so I have to clean it up a little bit. <laughs> but uh, So uh, we can send it back on to WIPS here, and you can have it. it uh, most of the things come on the, uh, the, our website in the Diocese of Des Moines, too, that we publish. But we can send it back if you want. Have you got your year on their mailing list? Yes. Okay, so I'll send it back to them after I have a chance to I put a lot of things in the margin here. So after speaking last night, one of the things I think that uh, came out last night, didn't come out today so much, was there seems to be some strong headwinds that are different here in Wisconsin than in Iowa, you know. <laughs> so uh, how that all comes to play, I, I'm an outsider, so I don't have any, uh, you know, judgment on that. But... Uh, it's re reality, and so perhaps you have to be more, you know, um, use your imagination greater or something. I don't know what it is, but that was came up very prominently during the discussion point, last, discussion time last evening, and so how that works out is different from us. Okay, face them for the east, uh, but then they probably won't generate any electricity. I mean, that's the problem. Huh? <laughs> Okay, well, thank you all for coming out tonight. Muchas gracias. And keep up the good fight because I think we will prevail. Thank you.